evening, church. Amen. It's good to be in the house of God tonight, and it is so good to see you. Welcome. You look good. It's, it's good to see you. Despite all that's going on, you look good. Amen. God is a good God, and we're so glad you're here. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I pray that tonight is an awesome night for you. I pray that tonight is a night that you are going to experience God in a way that you've never experienced God before. I pray that tonight is a night that you walk out of here a whole lot better than you did, encouraged and ready to just go out and win the world for Jesus. Amen. All right, it's good to see you. Would you stand? Let's welcome the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you are welcome in this place. We welcome you, God, and we thank you for the sacred space that we have. We thank you for the safety of this place. God, speak to us tonight. Let not one person leave without having had an encounter with the Most High God. In the mighty name of Jesus. And the people of God who love God said, Amen. Go ahead and put your hands together tonight.
that you can bring friends into a place where everyone is welcome, where everyone has a place at the table, where there are no walls, where we are building bridges and not boundaries. In Jesus' name, thank you, God. We're getting ready to sing a song that we haven't sung since December, I think, maybe even before that. And um, it is a song, I can only speak for myself, that really speaks to me. It spoke to me then, but it speaks to me so much more today. And I just want to encourage you to just forget a thing around, about the things that are going on around you. Forget about the people next to you, behind you, in front of you. And if this song speaks to you, if, if you feel the presence of God, I just want to encourage you to just let go and worship. Because I promise you I will, and it might get ugly, but <laughs> it's so true. This song is so true. It says, it is well, no matter what. We know who we are and whose we are, but we know who will lead us and hold our hand and take us down the path that we go, whatever that is. And I just have to rest in this peace. And I've seen a lot of new faces tonight. And I just want to encourage you to just let go and truly worship in the way you do, however that is. from my regard through it all through it all my eyes are on you through it all through it all it is well through it all through it all my eyes are it is well with me. That's the good part. Far be it for me to not believe even when my eyes can't mountain that's in front of me will be thrown into the midst of the sea. Trust in you, the wisdom. 
Every one of us come from a different place tonight. Every one of us come from a different dynamic. <laughs> There's lots of emotions in this room, and that's one thing I love about Wednesday night worship is some of these weeks <laughs> are hell, and we can come into this safe place Come into this place where we all have different baggage, different concerns, different victories, different defeats. And hear words like, it is well with my soul. I want you to think about those mountains that are in front of you right now. Think about those things in your life that just 
seem like they overshadow all the goodness that you hear about on Sundays and Wednesdays. And I want you to think about that mountain literally being removed by the God that we serve. The mountains of depression, the mountains of insecurity, the mountains of hurt and past failures, the mountains of a broken down world and political system, the mountains of families that have been torn apart by religious organizations, the mountains of a breakup, or something as simple as the mountains of I don't know what to do with my career. And look at that mountain that's in front of you, and I want you just to, for a minute, imagine what could happen if you had let that mountain go. And you would lift your eyes to the hills which go beyond those mountains from whence cometh your help, knowing that your help cometh from something that's greater than any of us. And then just prophesy those words, so let go. So let go, my soul, and trust in you. The waves and wind still know your name so let go my soul and trust in you the waves and wind still know your name the waves of so let go my soul to sing it out and trust in you the waves and wind Still know your name. So let go, so let go, my soul, and trust in you. The ways and ways still know your name. And finish it off with through it all, and through it all, through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you. Through it all. Through it all, through it all, it is well. Through every sickness, through it all, through it all, my eyes are on you, and it is well with me. Amen. Maybe seated. Help me with this thing. Thanks, Reverend. Oh, people of God, how are you feeling? Ah, I see some. Some nice smiles out. Smiles I recognize, others I don't. Smiles I can see on the front row and others I can barely distinguish on the back row. Um, but it is our prayer and our hope that you will be blessed as you already have by your God. And we're very clear, it's not anyone else's God. It's your God. It's the one, the spirit, the divine who lives not within me, but the one who lives within you. Our scripture for this evening comes from the book of Joshua. Now it is a very difficult book to preach from. One, because there are a lot of issues involved in the book of Joshua and just in this entire time period that are very difficult. And we know that even in difficult situations, something good can still come about. Do you believe that? And so it's our hope and our prayer that as we try to navigate through some of these conquest narratives where I'll tell you what's good for one or two people may not be good for everyone else, but as we begin to navigate through the book of Joshua tonight, that God can speak to you as God speaks to all of us. 
The book of Joshua says, No one will be able to stand against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For your God will be with you wherever you go. Let's pray. Holy One, we are thankful for another day and another opportunity to experience the goodness in this life. We ask you now to give us peace in our hearts, calm our minds, and help us to receive your light and your love this evening as we always might. God bless us. In Jesus' name, and all the people say, amen. This is ridiculous. You don't want to be a nun. Yes, I do, Dorothy. God reminded me today that I've always had a dream, a very private dream, one I never talked about. When I was growing up, I wanted to join the convent. Well, until I was 17. <laughs> what happened then? Your father put his hand in my blouse. <laughs> so, so, I felt soiled, filthy, dirty. You know, in love. <laughs> But this time, I'm going to fulfill my destiny. This time, I'm going to become a nun. Oh, Sister Claire, how nice to see you again. Come in. Dorothy, this is Sister Claire. She interviewed me last week about joining her order. Please, sit down. Ma, you actually went to a convent? Why didn't I know that? Because you're divorced. Technically, in the eyes of the church, you don't even exist. <laughs> I spit on you. <laughs> Unless, of course, the sister would like to spit on you first. I'm her daughter, Dorothy. You'll have to excuse my mother. She suffered a slight stroke a few years ago, which rendered her totally annoying. <laughs> and uh, what brings you here? The follow-up interview. We have very strict guidelines when selecting postulants, so we're going to put Sophia through a battery of psychological tests. It helps weed out the crazies and undesirables. Sorry, Ma. <laughs> Imagine Rose is trying to blame the whole thing on me. That woman has one hell of a lot of nerve. <laughs> Hello. I'm a Baptist. Uh, any Baptists we have here in the house? Any Baptists? Yeah, look at them. I see you. Any nuns in the house? Any nuns? There we are. I see you. <laughs> so the clip is from a show called The Golden Girls. You ever heard of The Golden Girls? Yeah. Now, oh, that's a, that's a, we had loud shouters here on the front row. <laughs> a lot of Golden Girls fans. I'll be honest, I did not see a single episode of The Golden Girls until I got to seminary. Yes, right after the Bible, um, all the Episcopal priests in school um, we, we'd study, we'd read, we'd pray, and then we'd have fellowship and watch Golden Girls <laughs> with uh, glasses of wine. And it was a, always a good time. But if you're not familiar with the show, it's great. It's wonderful. Um, um, four housemates are all living together. The woman you just saw, Sophia, um, and she's probably the eldest uh, in the house. And in this episode of the Golden Girls, one of Sophia's best friends, uh, Sister Agnes, passes away. Now, I don't know how you deal with death when it happens in your life, but Sister Agnes was very special to Sophia. And so when Sister Agnes passes away, Sophia responds to death like any of us might respond to death, right? It unnerves us. We start getting scared, right? When, when loved ones pass away or loved ones die, all of a sudden we have to rethink and shift how we think and, and live and just move in our daily lives. Many times we begin to look at our own humanity and we start saying, whoa, maybe I need to get my life together, right? If you look at the, uh, if you end up watching an episode of the Girl Golden Girls, specifically this episode, you'll notice that there are a lot of feelings that Sophia has in this episode, which she normally doesn't have in a lot of the Golden Girls episodes. But like you might expect, someone dies. And if someone dies, we have to have feelings, right? We've got to show emotion. We have to grieve in the way that we only know how. And for Sophia, 
It makes Sister Agnes' death, it, it causes her to rethink her entire priorities in her life. How she lives, it frightens her. She's sad like you might be sad. She gets angry like you get angry sometimes. And she wants to make things right in her life. Now, she doesn't necessarily know what those things are, though. She wants to make sure, and she even quotes this in the, in the actual episode, she wants her life to be meaningful in this world. And for her, that means joining a convent, right? For her, she's going back to her childhood where she remembered that she always wanted to be a nun. A good person just died, and a good person who was trying to make the world a beautiful place. And so for Sophia, she wants to join a convent because who else is going to take Sister Agnes's place? You look at the world, it's going to hell in a handbasket, some of us look at, right? So many bad things going on, violence, refugees, uh, kids from Iran can't even have operations in the United States because of our new immigration ban that's currently on hold. But so many different things. And people say, and Sophia says, all right, I've got to do something in this world. Sister Agnes is not here. I'm going to step in where Sister Agnes cannot be right now. Now we find out that she wants to live this meaningful life like we all want to live meaningful lives, do we not? And what happens is she remembers her childhood dreams. Now she answers this call and she joins the nunnery. Now you might expect um, Sophia isn't the best candidate to be a nun. <laughs> Some of us in this room aren't the best candidates <laughs> to be nuns. Um, maybe it's because Sophia keeps it real. Now, we like people who keep it real, do we not? But some people keep it too real, right? A little too real. And Sophia, she likes to tell the truth. And so she goes in her little nunnery, and she's got a picture of, of her, His Holiness, the Pope. And then it's a two-sided picture, so when you flip it over, it's not the Pope. It's actually some, some hunky man, some famous actor at the time. Let's face it, it isn't her calling, her daughter Dorothy comes at the end of the episode and reminds her, just reminds her at the end of the show that her life before the nunnery was meaningful. She helped out in so many different ways, not just around the house, but in the community. When her friends needed help, when people needed her to reach out, she did so and she did it with love. Now she did it in honesty and truth like only Sophia can, but she still did it in a way that created meaning for people in their lives. Dorothy reminds Sophia this, and by doing so, reminds Sophia what she's called to be. It's what we're called to be. And yes, it is to live a meaningful life, but it's to live our lives. You see, Sophia didn't need to join a nunnery to have a meaningful life. You don't need to be pastors to be a meaningful life. No matter what you are in this life, we're all followers of Jesus, and we're all called to be that wherever we might be. Now, shift happens, as we say. It's the name of our sermon series. And tonight, we want to say don't panic, even when shift happens. Shift is happening. It's happening all the time. And the reality is, the reality is, people of God, that fear is going to come upon us wherever we are in our lives. Now, the issue is, how are we going to respond to this fear when it comes about. Poor Sophia, she even hears the voice of God telling her to go be a nun and do something that is not her calling. And I dare say that many of us in this room, I have myself, thought I heard the voice of God because of the fears that were going on in my life. Poor Sophia felt her fears and she felt the negative emotions and she focused on possible negative outcomes after this death of her friend, Sister Agnes. And so much so, people of God, that she allowed the negativity and all the fear to move her from her place in God. Point number one for this evening. Don't let your fears run your life. Don't let your fears run your life. Don't let your fears run your life. I realize that when we step into this room, there's a certain spirit. 
it is well with my soul, we sing. And I also realize that as soon as we step out the doors of this building or any sacred place that we have in our lives, it may not feel so safe any longer, amen? And yet we also have to recognize that wherever we are, God still is. Wherever we are, God is still there. And so why is it that we lose sight of all the things that God is doing and we only focus on the evil and the negative and the violence and all things that are going bad? Is it because we're human? Well, that's part of it. Maybe it's a little more than that. Sometimes we become so concerned with the negative that we, we forget all about God and good. Now, uh, we're watching out for evil so often that we forget what good looks like, people of God, and when we do that, we also forget what God looks like. Now, there was a time in my life when I, uh, my young 34 years, I will say, that we forget uh, um, um, where we've come from in our lives. Many years in my life, I focused everything I focused every moment of my prayer life. I focused every moment of my studies. I focused every moment of my spiritual life on all things evil. Now, I was out there doing all kinds of stuff. I ain't talking about all that, and I ain't going to tell you all that right now. <laughs> but what I am saying, at this point in my life, imagine this. You're attending church three, four nights a week, not because you're employed or you're a pastor, just because you love going to church. Go into Bible studies when you're not in church. And when you're not in church, then you're uh, on the streets of downtown Houston at bus stops praying with people and trying to give some people hope in their lives. Not because you've seen anything good in them, but because the world is going to hell in a handbasket. People of God, maybe you were like me. When I wasn't at church, I could be found praying with people and passing out religious tracts at events like Mardi Gras. Events like Southern Decadence. I didn't go to Southern De Decadence back then, but you know what we're talking about. Wherever I went, I told people, maybe you did this too. We say we're religious people, and we're God people, and we go around and we tell people, you're going to hell. We go around and tell people, get your life right. You're living an evil and sinful life. Wherever I went, I told people that they needed to say a specific prayer because their life was not right. And I'm going to be very honest. The majority of my prayers, people of God, were spent on praying not for something. They were spent praying against something. Against demons. Praying against evil spirits. But then I'll tell you, one day something clicked, not just in my mind, but in my very spirits. I was becoming angrier as a so-called Christian. I was not my usual jovial self. And I suddenly real realized that in all of my communications, not with just other followers of Jesus, but in my communication with God, I was not actually talking to God at all. You ever notice you pray so much and the prayer isn't so much about your God it's about all these other things, these negative things, these violent things, these things that are shifting us in our daily lives. I realized that I was ignoring God and focusing my attention on what I really feared day in and day out. And that was all of the negative incomes, outcomes, and incomes. Amen. What I really feared was evil and even more specifically, like you fear. You fear the boogeyman, do you not? The boogeyman and the devil. Back in my childhood, we called the boogeyman the kukui. You remember the kukui? <laughs> you're little kids, and, and you're scared of the, uh, the kukui and the boogeyman under the bed. Right? You're, you're in your bedroom, and you want to sneak to the kitchen and get a snack, and all your, your cousins or your brothers or sisters, they see that you have to go down this scary hallway. And so you begin to make your way, and they say, ooh, kukui, and you run right back to your room. <laughs> Forget about the cookie. And I notice when we're kids, we have this boogeyman and uh, the devil, the kukui, whatever you want to call this individual. And yet, as we grow older, you'll notice that we never really grow out of the boogeyman. As we grow older as kids, we never lose sight of the boogeyman. 
Yeah, boogie, boogeyman may have lived in our houses, but now we just transfer the boogeyman to our daily lives. Not just our physical lives, I mean our spiritual lives as well. How is it that we as kids, I always find it fascinating, we grow out of this Santa Claus, which is this so good, this grit figure, right? Very positive, Santa Claus. Ah, Santa Claus ain't real. Get over it, kids. And the boogeyman, oh, the boogeyman's very real. We're scared of the boogeyman because we've experienced hell in our lives. And so because we've experienced it, we think the boogeyman is there every moment of the day. And yet, we have to ask the question, why do we have any use for evil when there's something called God? Why do we have any use for the boogeyman when there's something called Jesus in our lives? Is it this natural tendency that's in all humanity to focus on those things that hinder us as people? What about the tendency to focus on those things that empower us as followers of Jesus? Fear helped me, Reverend Michael. A lot of people say this. If I didn't have fear in my life, I'd be in a much worse place. Now I want to recognize that we all do see this in our lives, right? Sometimes, because of one negative experience, we use that as data to carry on in our future lives, and our future steps. Because of this data, I'm going to use it now to interpret what's coming up next. And so I had this one bad experience. I'm not going to have another bad experience. And sometimes we take that data and we make it much, much bigger than what it's supposed to be. Many people say that the data has saved my life fears. By watching out for the boogeyman, by watching out for that car that's coming across the street, I saved my life. By watching out for people who are like my ex-husband or people like my ex-wife, I've saved my life and I've saved others' lives. I have survived, people say, because of fear in my life. By not trusting and by creating fearful realities and images of others, I have survived. That's happened to me. Our gospel, it's not gospel, it's going to be gospel tonight. Our gospel text tonight is Joshua. It's not really the gospel, it's the Old Testament text. But Joshua says, no one will be able to stand against you all the days God is supposedly talking to Joshua in this text. Now, Many people do not know that um, it's a hard text, this conquest narrative that we all preach from. We all say, oh, yes, God is going to send us to this land of milk and honey, right? And the reality is there were other people living on this land of milk and honey. And so to get that milk and honey, we have to get rid of those people who have the milk and honey and so the text is encouraging Joshua. Joshua, I will be with you. Do not fear those other people. Do not fear them. I will be with you every step of the way. Now, it's a very moving, moving text. Absolutely. I agree with you. Now, when you take it in context, it becomes a bit more complicated. And it fits real nicely into this theme of fear that we're talking about this evening. You see, many peop people think that the book of Joshua was written by Joshua. I hate to tell you, it was not written by any person named Joshua. The book of Joshua was actually written years later after the ancient Israelites were in exile. Now, you have to think, there's these different tribes of people who all come together, and yes, they may have conquered a few other people in the land, but they come together and they have this land of milk and honey, but guess what? You reap what you sow, the Bible says, right? And so these folks rid the land of all these other folks. And what happens later, the Babylonians, years later, come and they conquer the Israelites. And they conquer the kingdom. And so what happens is they destroy the temple of the ancient Israelites. Now, I want you to hear this. Because we think they destroy the temple and it's like a church building. They just destroy the church. The reality is, in ancient Israel, the temple is where God lived. So think of this, this place where God is, this place that is supposed to be so safe and so sacred, this place that you hold dear that got you through your toughest times in your life, this place that is God. 
now destroyed. This place is gone. How do you feel? You feel like the world has ended. Many people thought God was in fact dead. And what happened is the ancient Israelites went into Babylonian exile. And while they're in exile, they've got to find new ways of experiencing God, right? They're fearful and they're scared. Like so many of us get fearful and scared. And they're in this and they've got to come out of it. Years later, they do come out. But when they begin to come out of the exile because of an anointed one uh, who's known as the Persian King Cyrus, uh, uh, defeats the Babylonians and, and releases the Israelites, if you will. They have a bit more freedom to do what they will. Then they begin to look back on the ancient days, the good old days, as we like to call them. And then they start putting together these different stories and they edit them. Now, you know what happens when we tell stories of back in the day. Somehow we always look a bit more mightier, don't we? Sometimes we always look a bit, a bit more hulkier, don't we? Sometimes we make ourselves seem as if we're, we're the epitome of all the other nations in the world. And that's what the ancient Israelites do once they come out of exile. They start writing these texts and say, this is who we were, Joshua. This is who we were and this is who we are today. This is where the point comes in. We write these texts and we forget about the real experiences. But you have to remember, these are people who've experienced hurts. So now they've got to in a sense, rewrite the story of their lives. Yes, they've had all the negative things that happened. Yes, God died in the temple, so to speak. Yes, their place in their nation was destroyed. Yes, all these negative things happened. And guess what? They still decided to write the story as if God was right there with them every step of the way. I don't know about you, but that gives me hope. That encourages me. That, that puts much more complexity and a good complexity into this book of Joshua. Now, yes, so many other nations down the line, including us here in the United States, we use these texts to conquer other peoples, to conquer indigenous peoples, and to use it as an exclamation point and a sort of motivation to go out and conquer anything else in the world because God is on our side. And we've got to realize it's not all about us. It's about other people as well. You see, after the story, when they rewrote some things, people began to realize that, yes, people, the ancient Israelites, they came out with the milk and the honey. But so many other people did not. They survived. You see? They survived. They survived by playing on their fears. They survived by relying on these fears, and these fears pushed them to actually act out on other people. These fears that if we don't take this milk and honey and we don't take this land, someone else will, and if we don't kill them, they're going to kill us. Their fears drove them, and their fears led them. They survived. But people of God, it's not just about surviving. It's about being fully alive in this world. You may be like Joshua who gained plenty of wealth and plenty of land while conquering this land of milk and honey. You may be like the ancient Israelites in the story of the conquest. You gain much. But at what cost? At what cost? Was it the cost of slaughtering innocent lives of indigenous peoples who were already there? Was it the cost of shunning entire people and refugees just so you can survive in this world? Just so you can survive. God doesn't want just you to survive. God created us and wants us to be fully alive, all of us. And if you want to be fully alive, you can't focus on your fears or your negativity. You can't let them drive you or drive us. Now, we have to be clear also, um, doing so, focusing on, your, uh, on, on the positive things in life instead of the negative. You know, don't panic. Focus on God. Yes, we focus on God, but does that mean we ignore the injustices that are happening right now in our lives? Does that mean we ignore the pain that we're experiencing right now in our lives? Absolutely not. And so when people are denied basic things like health care in our society, we will speak out. 
when people's rights are being threatened, we will stand up and resist and protest like good followers of Jesus because we know that a act of justice is always the best form of prayer in our lives and in our society. Whether you're doing prayerful actions or you sit there in contemplative prayer, whether you attend church or you live your lives where you struggle day by day, we have to make sure that our motivations stem from hope and not fear. About 11 years ago, I, um, I entered the process for ordination to become uh, an ordained clergy person. And you go through these weird things as a clergy person, don't you? You go through these weird things. You got to pay all this money for seminary, for schooling, for education, clinical pastoral education. Um, and they also make you do a psychological test to weed out the crazies and undesirables, <laughs> as we saw in the video. And I remember the psychological assessment because it was, it was a little different for me. You know, my family, we didn't grow up talking to other people about our feelings or what was on the inside. Does that make sense? We didn't grow up like that. And so you sit there with the therapists and counselors and psychologists and they're like, so tell us about your childhood. Tell us about your relationship with your mother. And you want to say, that's not your business, yeah? <laughs> and then they warm you up and they ask you more questions and you begin to actually open you up. Well, there's one part where you take all these tests. I tell you, you take so many tests. It's like 200 questions or something. And you feel like they're all the same questions, just ask in different ways. And you take the assessment and the questionnaires, and at the end of it, they know everything there is to know about you. Now, the test revealed a lot of things. But one of the things that struck out most for me was, yes, it confirmed my long-standing passion for doing justice in this world. I was very happy about that. Praise God. I didn't lie about that. But the test also revealed something else. The counselors told me that um, my motivations for engaging in social justice seem to be coming from a more pessimistic outlook. And I said, so what? <laughs> All right. I'm for social justice, right? I'm for people who are living better lives. I don't understand what your point is. And I said, well, here's our point. The more you rely on this well of negativity to drive you in your calling in your life, the more you drive from this well where you look at the entire world and say, this whole world is going to hell, there's evil, there's violence, there's the boogeyman everywhere. The more you draw from this well, you're not going to find any sort of peace in your life at all. And they said, Michael, we can see it in you and we've seen it in many other people. Clergy burnouts after 10 years. Not only do they lose their faith in their community, they lose their faith in their denomination, they lose their faith in their own God. And the reason is because they're not looking at all the goodness that's driving. They're not seeing the optimism, the hope, and the potentiality in our society. They're only looking at all the negative things. I said, hmm. Hmm. I didn't know how to change that. I didn't know how to change that because what drew me to the church, yes, was this supposed good God, but to be honest with you, it wasn't the goodness of God, right? It was the evilness of humanity that drove me to want to become a pastor. It was the evilness of how people treated one another that, wanted to, that made me want to better humanity. And I thought that was good. And these folks are telling me, no, it's not good. Yes, you might survive, but you're not going to fully be alive in your life. And so I had to change the way I looked at the world, the way I viewed the world. I had to change how I looked at my God. Instead of letting fears haunt me, I had to awaken to a faith and a goodness. Let's face it, it was already there, but you got to look at it. You got to see it. You look over here, you see a screen that works. You look over here, what do you see? A screen that does not work, right? And the more you look at that screen, is it going to help you in your life? Not in one bit. You won't know the lyrics. You won't be able to see the scripture. You won't know anything. But if you look at that screen during worship, 
You'll be able to see the words. You'll sing along and you'll participate. Now, I'm not saying a blank screen is negative because sometimes blank screens can be very good. But the fact that we do have a projector out, that's a negative thing. <laughs> but we're going to focus on the positive thing for this evening. Let go of the negative, focus on the positive. And let me tell you what the positive is, people of God. It's God who lives within you. It's God who is right here. Not God just out here, but God who lives right here. How many of you love Buffy the Vampire Slayer? Golden Girls, Buffy. What about True Blood? Any True Blood fans? Oh, amen. All right. Take it easy now. Now, whether you saw Buffy, you saw True Blood about vampires and whatever else, um, you've all lived the vampire life before. You've experienced it, right? You get around individuals who come and they suck the life out of the room and they suck the life out of you, right? Everything is a negative thing. Everything is something that could go wrong in their lives. Right? We've all had that. And if you think you've never had that, be careful because it might be you who's been sucking the life <laughs> out of all your friends. And the reality is, we can't just be vampires in our lives. We can't just suck the life and the energy and the essence out of the room. We can't just focus on the negative. We have to focus on God who lives within us. Maybe you're here this evening, you're burdened with the thought that a negative God disapproves of who you are because of something you've done. Maybe because all the junk that you've had to go through in your life. Get rid of that negative image and trust God who lives within you. Maybe a relationship has fallen apart and you don't think you can survive in this hectic dating world in the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. I don't know how y'all do it out here. I don't know how you do it. Let go of the fears and trust God within you. Maybe you've been put in a box because of your past mistakes and you've been underestimating yourself for all these years. Maybe you've been living with the disease your whole life. You actually think you are the disease right now. Let go of that fear and trust God within you. Maybe you should release and let go and liberate yourself from all that is trying to destroy you in your personhood, in your spiritual life, in your physical life. Anything that takes away from your sacred value. Trust God within you. Maybe this whole searching for God thing has worn you out and you're tired of fear-based religion. Welcome to the club, sister. I'm right with you. Welcome to the club. Let it go be free and trust God within you. I am not afraid. I am not afraid. I am not afraid. All is well. All is well. Repeat after me. I am not afraid. All is well. I trust spirit. I trust spirit who lives within me. May it be so. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You sort of stole my thunder with Buffy, but um, you'll all get another sermon from me, so you're welcome. Um, so for... <laughs> Right now, this is time for you to take the red registration pad at the end of your aisle. We would love it if you made sure that we had your, at least your name and email, because we want to make sure that you're getting all the emails about all the new wonderful stuff that's coming up that we're doing. And just a preview of that is that shift is happening, as you've noticed. Um, and so what that is, is basically all of our new programming that we're going to be um, unveiling at the beginning of Lent, the last Sunday, the last week of February. Until that moment, we would love for you to be a part of it by finding your spiritual location. So what we're doing is looking at how we want you to grow, how we want you to deepen your faith with God, journey with other people, connect with other people, feel cared for and care for others by finding where you are at spiritually. Does that sound exciting? 
to do that, we need you to find your spiritual location. So there are gonna be groups that we would love for you to join, gatherings that are gonna help you meet other people and find your spiritual location. We are gonna have two here right before um, Pulse Worship. They're gonna be at six o'clock, um, the 15th and the 22nd, that's Wednesdays. We'd love for you to sign up online. There's more information in your worship bulletin tonight. Um, I want you to look up, though, um, our website, www.cathedralofhope.com slash shift. And all the information will be there and there'll be a button where you can find your spiritual locations. There, there can be other ones that you can go to and we'd love to have you do that. Um, also, we, wanna, we want you to note that we are actually celebrating, of course, Black History Month here at Cathedral of Hope. This Sunday, there's going to be a filming of From Selma to Stonewall, um, which is the intersectionality of um, the civil rights movement and the LGBTQ civil rights movement. I um, mean, we'd love to have you come to that. All the information is the back of your bulletin. Um, I'm going to be there. Um, Reverend Neal is going to be on a panel, and we'd love to have you support that wonderful ministry. And there's other opportunities you're going to see there as well. Um, town hall meeting is coming up this Saturday at 11 o'clock. We'd love to have you come by. It's just basically a time where we have some snacks, and we find out what's going on at the church, and we'd love to have you there just to kind of get to know us a little bit more and find out what's happening. Um, and last but not least, today is when we give out our blessing bags. So for those of you who brought stuff last week, um, who got the the list of, of things to bring, brought them this week. Blessing bags are our mi wonderful minister. You probably saw people doing that as, the, as you came in earlier. Um, as you exit, you'll get a blessing bag. And what that is, is a bag full of food and items for homeless people in our community. We want to empower you to take into your own hands a way to bless tangibly other people. And so our hope is that you will take that, you will hand that out to those who need it, and you will pray for them and consider them part of our family here. So my hope is that you have found blessing here tonight, that you have gone from maybe a little bit of fear to hopefully embracing the beauty and hope of the God that is within you. Amen. So let us have our time where we are receiving our tithes and offerings. If you are part of this community or if you're here for the first time and you want to support us financially, we would love that. We're going to take our tithes and offerings and hope that you are finding yourself blessed here tonight. Your 
Jesus, how I love you. How beautiful it is to recognize and to feel that love, to, to recognize that we are loved by an amazing God. That God that He want to live a tangible way to let us know that we are loved. Many, many years on that room, surrounded by friends and family, women and men and kids, Jesus took bread and He blessed it, He gave thanks. He broke it, and he gave it to everyone, saying, don't be afraid. Don't let those cuckoos in your head or in your heart <laughs> get you afraid from taking this bread, from get here to get out from the boat and walk into the waters of that love. And in the same way, Jesus took the cup. He gave thanks for it. And he shared it with everyone, saying, take and drink. This is my life. This is the life that is going to be poured out for you. There's no, no moments for you to be afraid. There's no reasons for you to be scared. There's no reasons for you to feel that you are not worth it or that you are not loved. Because these elements are going to remind you Every time when you get together with your friends, with your family, when people that you don't know, with people that you don't have nothing in common. But when you share this meal with them, you will know that you are loved and you will be part of that love sharing this meal together. Yeah, Pastor Isabella reminds us, as Reverend Mike did in his sermon, that context is everything. And the context of this meal, for us as Christians, we often forget that this had a different context for our Jewish siblings. And so when Jesus shared this meal around that table that night, He was sharing something that they had remembered from past experience. And I guess that many of us in this room this evening also come to this table with some past experience. Perhaps for some of us, we come at this meal thinking that we're not worthy 
Perhaps some of us come at this meal believing that somehow I'm not good enough. Some of us come at this meal believing that everything in my life has to be right with God before I can encounter God. And some of us come at this meal believing that unless I believe the right thing or think the right thing, then I'm not able to take this meal. I want to set a new context for us tonight. All of those things are untrue. All of those things are untrue because there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Amen. Jesus, neither height Amen. nor depth, neither principalities nor personalities, not the demons in our heads and the voices that continue to tell us that we're unworthy. There are nothing that can separate us from the love of God because when Jesus sat with his disciples that night, he didn't look at Judas and say, Judas, you're about to betray me, you can't receive. He didn't look at Peter and say, there'll come a time in just a few days when you'll deny me three times, you can't come to this table. <coughs> mm -hmm. He didn't say to Mary, his mother, you're not worthy. He didn't say to any of those who were gathered around the table, he just looked at them and loved them mm -hmm. and invited them to find the very positive place within their life. Mm -hmm. And it was from that place that Jesus invited them to the table. So this evening as we pray a blessing upon this meal, I pray that we might be able to cast out some demons tonight. <laughs> the demon of I'm not good enough. The demon of I'm not worthy enough. The demon that says somehow something is not right about me in this life. And hear fresh and anew the word of God this night. Whosoever believeth in me shall never perish, but have everlasting life. Not whosoever with an asterisk, not whosoever, whosoever. I'm a whosoever. Are you a whosoever? No, come on, are you a whosoever? <laughs> yeah? Then know that you are welcome at this table. Let us pray. God, we pray that you are blessed and simply sanctify these gifts of bread and wine and fruit of the vine that they may become for us a meal of liberation, a meal that calls us from the place of panic to the place of trust, a meal that sets us free so that we may no longer need to listen to the negativity of the world but focus upon you. And in that promise, God, you draw us out to be ambassadors in the world, to be agents of change in the world, to be transformers in the world. And we do that not just on our own, but we do that in community, and we do that in the strength and the power of this meal. So feed us tonight, God. Feed us just as we are. Feed us in this sense of holy and divine so that we might see shift happening within us and within our world. We pray your blessing, therefore, in the mighty name of Jesus that lives in each and every one of us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. So the invitation has been given, and the response is for us. Are we in? And if we are, come. We invite the ushers and the servers to come and finish preparing this table and then come. May not one of us be left behind. Let
You know, it's always, uh, always amazes me that worship is a living, breathing organism. No matter how much you think you've planned, no matter how much you think you're on a particular track for a particular worship service, when we're open to the Spirit, she just comes in and just changes everything. Yeah. And I don't know about you, but I have felt the spirit of change in this service this evening. This was not exactly how I thought it was going to work out this evening. Wednesday nights are supposed to be happy, clappy, and dance, and shout, and do a quick lap around the sanctuary and go home, um, according to Reverend Andre. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, sometimes the Spirit makes a different direction, and I don't know about you, but I felt a very healing spirit um, in the room this evening, and I'm, to that I want to give God the honor, but I also want to give us the honor because we remained open to what God was going to do, and we didn't force something other than what God intended for the night. So I'm going to invite you to give God a hand praise this evening. And if that wasn't your experience, come back next week because it might be your experience next week. So um, uh, before we uh, close in worship, you know, we've been uh, d doing some things for Black History Month. Uh, you'll see some of those in the uh, bulletin this evening. And I'm looking forward to working to ensure that this congregation is as diverse as we possibly can be and to make sure that folks and people of color specifically feel as welcome here as, as white folk um, in this congregation. So look out for some of those things that we're going to be inviting uh, black voices specifically uh, to help engage this congregation and help us uh, to live more fully into our authentic selves as a diverse, progressive congregation. Um, as you leave this evening, there is, uh, there's going to be some flyers for you about uh, another documentary that's being shown um, here in Dallas shortly. It's called Second Chance, um, and it's something else that we're promoting for Black History Month. And it really is about a social justice um, notion of the way in which segregation continues to happen, um, even in our country today, and specifically here in Dallas, um, acknowledging the div dividing lines, uh, specifically along race, uh, but also for uh, specifically uh, men of color um, and how the system of oppression continues to um, f ensure uh, so often that uh, men and people of color don't have the same chances that people who have privilege and specifically white privilege um, have in our country and in our nation and here in Dallas. So I'm going to encourage you to open your mind to engage those things, uh, as uncomfortable sometimes as those conversations may be, but necessary conversations if we're truly going to heal the world and it begins by healing each and every one of us. And that began, I hope, here this evening as we step fully into our authentic selves and into the liberation, casting out fear and allowing love to be at the very center of it all. So uh, watch out for those. There'll be some flyers as you leave this evening and check out all the information of Black, Black, Black History Month um, in our bulletin this evening. So I'm going to invite you to pick up a blessing bag as you leave, pick up a flyer, uh, find someone who's homeless on the way home, make sure that they get a blessing as much as you did this evening, and let's go in peace and let's love on one another. God bless you this night.